With that, hello everybody. What? Welcome everybody. It's kind of the formal welcome. You've been welcomed a couple times, which is great. Great to see 30 day. And uh, do we have any uh, new people uh, with us uh, that have never been to a meeting? If so, uh, wave your hand, say hello. Um, I know we have some uh, quote unquote old timers that go back to SAN here, to, here today. So that's wonderful. So I'm glad to see you all survive the election. And uh, I know that we um, don't really know the, the results uh, uh, completely. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll hear more about it uh, today and then uh, this afternoon. But as a lead into what I who I want to talk about and tribute is uh, Prop L, which was about transportation and paratransit. Uh, in Pi's honor, passed uh, overwhelmingly, we can say that. And um, uh, we are having a special tribute today to Pyra, our uh, champion at SDA and all of San Francisco uh, for transit justice. Pyra has been with us since beginning of time almost, since uh, Sand Days, Senior Action Network, and uh, then, of course, into SDA. And he is retiring. Uh, and I think he has retired, although I, I see some things that um, he's still been involved with here. He is uh, on, I think Sarah said, on the day of his retirement, he joined as a member. So he'll still be with us coming to meetings and all, hopefully, um, uh, over um, uh, um, Zoom, Zoom meetings, because he lives in the far in the East Bay. Uh, so it's hard for him to get here in person. I, I don't think Pyra's not with us today, though, is he? I don't. I didn't see him. But um, uh, as I said, Pyra has been so involved with SDA. He started uh, coming to meetings and um, uh, to the survival school, our SAN, and then SDA. Uh, well, this, when it was SAN, um, our one of our mother organizations, he uh, presented on paratransit because, and he used to work with uh, SF Walk. And uh, then he was invited to become a staff person and to be uh, the organizer leader of our, our transit justice and pedestrian safety program. Uh, and he's, and, and many other things. Uh, I'm sure staff will miss all his little puns and jokes, uh, sort of, uh, but <laughs> anyway, he's well known for, for that also. And I, wa I wanted to, um, you know, open it up a little bit if uh, people okay. hear. Ready? Yeah. What? Sorry, this is Jessica again. Before we do that, can I just explain the, um, oh, oh, what's yeah. on the, the screen here? Yeah, so, great. Um, I want to give um, Brian Hogsman from Walk SF credit for creating this a uh, fabulous oh. retirement card that is totally in the style of pie. It yes. says, we're not saying good pie to you, <laughs> Congra but congratulations on your retirement. And there's a, a picture of a cake there. And, um, and so there's a, a picture on the left of Pi speaking at a board of supervisors meeting in his characteristic um, yellow beret. Um, and I, actually on the captioning there, it says, we need more platforms, we need more accessibility. Um, and then there's a, a picture on the top right. I think that's Sid Corrales in front and a bunch of uh, other members. Yeah, it and it's, like um, it's an action about the street crossing time campaign mm -hmm. that, um, that Pi led and that was successful. And then there's a, a great picture um, near the bottom here of Pi. Um, I think this is relatively recent, maybe in the last couple of years. And he's got a blue, um, kind of a worn blue baseball cap with the, the math pie symbol on the front. Um, and it almost looks like he's wearing a collar and a tie, but I don't know. Um, and then there's a, a bike underneath it um, because Pi has always loved bicycling. Um, and I don't know what this other picture is. And then on the left, it says something about showing Segway the highway because Pi has of course, um, oh my goodness, look who entered the waiting room. All right, Betty, you can welcome the man of honor himself. <laughs> I just came in. Pi, hey, Pi, we're just do, doing your special tribute and for your retirement. Uh, and I hope you can see what's on the screen. Oh, oh, we just lost it. Anyway, where's Pi? I don't see it. Right, he's already seen it. I was going to spotlight Pi. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, do that, please. So, uh, okay, I don't, 
long as he's long as he's here. I'm so glad, Pa, you joined us. I'd hate to be giving you a tribute and you're not even here to hear it all. <laughs> so uh, we want to, uh, you know, uh, we're so grateful for all that you've done over over the many many years and how many you know people's lives you may have saved. You may not even know know uh, with all the work you've done in pedestrian safety. And um, I was just. Uh, uh, beginning to um, ask if some others here who know Pi and and are maybe part of the transit justice uh, uh, group would like to say a few words. I know Sarah said she might um, uh, like to say something. A staff who's been <laughs> working with Pi for many years, and uh, any others that, um, that oh there you are now I can see you. Hi Pi. <laughs> Hi. Okay. All right. There. I love your background. It reminds me of the Russian River, but anyway. Um, no, it's all frog pond. Okay. Oh, okay. Rebecca, Rebecca would like to say. Uh, you just unmute. Yes, I'd be happy to uh, say Good. something. So I've I've known Pi basically since uh, I started. Um, as a volunteer several years ago with SDA um, when we were in the office pre-COVID. And uh, it was it was always um, so great to work and always such a pleasure to work with him in the office and he gave me um, so much information as somebody new working there about where things were because I'm always a little directionally challenged, et cetera. So, and then as somebody like me who has visual impairment due to a stroke I had when I was a child, um, I was able to get involved with the transit justice program due to Pi helping me get involved with that program and uh, do so many activities with that, both through Zoom and in person. And there, it, I've just learned through so much through that, being able to be um, active with that. It's just, it's been so much, such a great learning experience and so great to, be part of a community through that uh has been a really great inspiration oh. so i've learned through so much through him great thank you so much rebecca yeah, yeah. wonderful any others that uh have a work uh with with pi would like to uh, say a couple words before uh well i'm herman oh. i'm a good friend of charles and uh, got me out to do one of the actions at, up at, I can't remember if it was, I don't think it was, was Target then at Gary and Masonic. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm one that crosses the street slow. And somehow I've never thought about changing the lights or anything like, you know, and, and in doing that, I, I realized it is a problem. Mm -hmm. you know? Problem. So, you know, thanks for coming up with that. And, and I, it turned out to be a very, very nice experience. So thank you. Thank you, Herman. I, I was there too at that uh, particular action. And uh, I completely agree. Uh, even just walking fast, uh, I couldn't get across that intersection, across Gary. And uh, so, yeah, and we also did uh, uh, that in other other crosswalks throughout the city in the Bayview and uh, I think out in the Excelsior uh, and led by Pi. Pi, would thank you, do you have uh, any words I for just us? want to say quickly, thank you, Herman. I love your shirt, as you can see, <laughs> good taste. I love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> good, <laughs> okay. Oh, I have a couple, uh, David? I don't know where to begin about talking about Pi. I met you, Pi, in the early 1990s, thanks to the late Jewel McGinnis. I think some of you might have known her. She was very active in SAN for many, many years. And it was because of people like Jewel and Pi that you had a very strong paratransit service from the very beginning in the late 1980s with Virginia Serenio. And uh, we fought like crazy the California some of us in the California Council of the Blind uh, <laughs> came to the came to San Francisco tried to keep Virginia Serenio and then we lost her because Muni wanted to get frankly wanted her wanted to get rid of her and we we made Muni wait for a year and we uh, we lost and Transdev who was then 
something in Teletran. They, they've changed their name like four or five times over the years. They took over, but you have a very strong service because of Pi. You have a very ver uh, versatile service. You have about four or five different services, which we don't have in the East Bay. And mm. it's all due to Pi. And then, of course, <laughs> Pi's work on Muni and fixed route uh, and transit justice has kept Muni on its toes for so long. And we will miss Pi greatly, but I know that he's not going to be leaving uh, SDA and he will always be with us and uh, hope that we will keep a very strong transit justice program alive in San Francisco. And I believe that we need to have a strong justice transit justice program in the East Bay. I know there's controversy around that, but I am going to go to the board and demand that we start a transit justice program in, in as many regions in the Bay Area as possible, because without transit justice, we're going to lose what we have and we need to keep it because it's been so wonderful. And with all the hard fought uh, gains that we've made and thank goodness for SDA. Thank you. Thank you. I like to say it was because of David, the Lighthouse for the Blind, the California Council for the Blind, we set up a system where we would have vans for at their disposal anytime they needed to do a demonstration or go down to City Hall uh, to speak their minds. And that was because um, mainly the Lighthouse for the Blind and California Council for the Blind, they needed to get down there and this was the best way. So. We made paratransit as one of the resources in order to get people down to City Hall and demonstrations. Yeah, that's great. And you, I know you also had people coming to our meetings, our general meetings using mm -hmm. paratransit. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, on the phone, I'm not sure who it is. Uh, it's probably me, Betty. Karen. Karen, yeah. Okay, I thought it might yeah. be Karen. Yeah. <laughs> I've known Pi for many years with a number of different hats. I think what I'm um, going to miss most is his reservoir of knowledge. He is always able to give history and, and um, provide perspective because he's been involved in this work for so long. His, his humor, his donuts, don't forget the donuts. Um, he's a very patient man and able to connect beautifully with people. So Pi, as soon as you have taken a long breath, come back to transit justice. <laughs> Great. That's that's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, everything you said was just bright. Yeah, definitely. And and uh, I hope that Pi will do that. We come to our general meetings. He's a member now and he's he's definitely a member of transit justice. I almost feel like we should we talked at the board meeting, we talked to have something named after Pi. Maybe it should be a paratransit van. I don't know, but <laughs> we need to look uh, into it. Sorry, something. it's we already have that label one with some paratransit. We had a division called Pyrotransit. Oh, Pyra Chance. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Pi, and uh, and everyone that spoke uh, uh, for him. And uh, we know you're you're not leaving us, as Karen said. You're going to be with us, and and David also. Uh, you're going to continue, and we definitely will be seeking your advice and and your counsel for sure in in all areas of paratransit and other areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pi. Thank you very much for having me for all these years, putting <laughs> up with all my puns. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. So I'll turn it back over to um, our next Jessica, I guess, election recap. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so who's relieved that the election is over? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we wanted to spend Not just over, a though. few the problem minutes. Is Hold on. We want to spend just a few minutes um, talking about some of the propositions, um, which a lot of you did a lot of work on, um, particularly propositions about affordable housing and transit. They haven't all been called yet. Um, it seems to take longer every time to count ballots, but maybe that's maybe that's good. Um, and uh, so they're expecting more results at four o'clock today. But what we know already is that Prop A passed. That's about um, the cost of living adjustment for uh, retirees. Um, and SDA had, had endorsed that. So that one, that's good news. 
Um, also Prop C, the Homelessness Oversight Commission, that one, um, which is also good. And we know there's some work to be done to make sure that we've got a lot of people on that commission who are seniors and disabled people who have been formerly homeless, who are currently homeless, who live in supportive housing, um, who really have the experience that we need for that. Um, we're still waiting on Prop D and E, so we're gonna come back to those. Um, some other highlights, um, Prop, oh, I'm gonna come back to INJ in a second too. Prop L has not yet been decided. I'm not, oh, because it needs a two thirds approval. Oh. So it's winning right now. Um, it's just above a two thirds approval. So keep your fingers crossed. That's the oh, one for transportation, okay. including paratransit. Yeah. Um, and Prop M also hasn't been called yet, but it's looking good. We're gonna come back to that. Um, and um, Prop O, unfortunately we supported that, the city college tax that did not win and that did get called. Um, so um, I wanna actually open it up to folks, particularly starting with housing. Um, there's a lot here to, uh, you know, to analyze and to be proud of as far as not only what the results were, but all the work that was done along the way. And so I want to invite um, anyone to share, what do you think about some of those housing propositions? And um, and there's some questions in the agenda, which I just realized we forgot to go over. So I'm sorry, we'll do that in a moment. But um, but want to hear what are folks proud of and how did how did we build power in senior and disability movements um, as part of this election. So who would like to say something? Well, if nobody else wants to speak, I could, oh, there's Edith. The we can start with you, Kathy, and then we'll go to Edith. No, yeah, start, start with her. Kathy. Good morning, start with her. She knows more than I do. That's not true, Kathy. Um, but yeah, I can start. Yeah, um, we did elections flyering every Tuesday for the election. Um, and I am very inspired by the members that, yeah, especially in the housing collaborative who helped me stay up to date, who um, made sure that they were up to date on the latest um, kind of putting your feelers out. I had a lot of conversations with Kathy and Steve and Carrie um, about what people were hearing in the kind of neighborhood around the housing propositions. So I'm, yeah, I'm grateful for the people that had hope. <laughs> we were, I think we had some calls maybe the last uh, day or so before the election. And it was kind of that feeling of like, you know, wanting to stay optimistic, but also not trying to get our hopes up too high. And I think when it comes to Proposition M, we, yeah, our, our optimist, optimism was well-placed. Um, so yeah, we also did some phone banking, Jessica and I, in a couple of days. And so the propositions that we were really pushing for in housing was yes on Prop M. So uh, Betty came up with Elmo, which was great, which encompassed some other ones. But we were saying yes on E, yes on M, and then no on D, uh, which I think we, uh, in Ligia's terms, D for decepcion. Um, and so those were the ones that we were really pushing for in housing. But we did kind of this bigger elections flyer with all the different propositions that we um, as an organization decided on earlier this year. So, yeah, no, feeling very grateful for the members that, that showed up and took the time. Kathy passed out flyers in her building. And, and I know Steve was kind of organizing his own uh, pieces around that and the people that came to flyering. So yeah, we showed up, which is cool. And I'll pass it over to you, Kathy. Well, it was nice that um, that that D lost, I think, because the apartment associations, both at the state level and at the city level, the San Francisco Apartment Association, put huge amounts of money into that. And so they got pushed back. Um, uh, I was also, you know, even though we, we lost uh, the one we were supporting, I'm glad that the word got out more to the public about the need for in more inclusionary housing. And uh, the message of what being that the housing that we have is just far too expensive for, for most people to, to buy. So um, it had some benefits. Um, I guess uh, we still have a huge struggle before us in terms of low and moderate and how we're gonna get that done. So thank you. Thanks, Edith and Kathy. Um, 
I want to share um, Betty's vote yes on Elmo um, poster that she took out there with a little picture of Elmo the Muppet. Um, and thank you, Betty. That was so much easier to talk to people um, as a way to remember instead of going through all the propositions to say vote yes on Elmo. Um, so, so that was great. Um, I also want to share, um, yeah. Betty sent me this picture of um, SDA and CARA member Henny Kelly um, and her husband, Dennis, who live in the Richmond. And this was a no on Prop D ad. And it says, we want our kids and grandkids to be able to live in San Francisco. Prop D will make that harder. And then, sorry, I don't know how to get this thing to stop blocking the text, but it says Prop D fails to build housing for the next generation. So those are, are pretty oh, great. Um, and I, you know, there've been some good conversations lately about, um, you know, where it's, it's not done yet. And so we're, we're very hopeful that D will, uh, will not pass and that M will pass. Um, but that we also did a lot of good oh. work getting the word out about the importance of deeply affordable housing and and we'll continue to fight um and of course the housing collaborative meeting is coming up edith is it next wednesday or the wednesday after it'll be next wednesday at 1 p.m and then i can also put something in the chat about a rally that's coming up the day before oh that's Kathy right and we'll hear more about that sorry yeah. we'll hear no, more no, about no. that in the announcements as well um but definitely get involved and Jessica, yes do you know what the current numbers are on D and E? Um, I had it here a moment ago. Um, so Prop D, uh, it's really close right now. No is 50.4%. Yes is 49.6%. Um, and they only have 150,000 wow. votes counted. And it sounds like they have almost 100,000 votes still to count. So it's really okay. hard to know. And then Prop and E is a no at 55% and a yes at 44%. Oh boy. Okay. Thank you. So um, wow. I also wanted to share Prop I and J um, have been really controversial. This is about whether um, JFK Drive should um, not have cars um, as, a, as a way to make it safer for pedestrians and bicyclists, or if cars should be allowed so that disabled drivers and other people um, can, can be able to get to all parts easily. Um, and related to that was Prop N, which um, would make some changes to the um, parking lot in the garage in Golden Gate Park. And that did pass overwhelmingly. So that's good news, whatever happens. Um, SDA um, decided not to take a position on I or J because um, we think it's, it's more complicated than just saying yes to cars by all means or no to cars at all. Um, and we had put out a, a statement that that members and board members worked on. Um, and if folks haven't seen that, we can certainly share it again. Um, and interestingly, I just saw yesterday that the, the League of Pissed Off Voters that does a voter guide that a lot of progressive folks look at, they said that they, they were originally thinking about supporting Prop J, which is for car-free JFK. Um, and they decided not to take a position um, in large part because they were influenced by SDA's concerns about access. So um, just want to thank and acknowledge all of our members who have really been fighting to make sure we have full accessibility in all the ways in Golden Gate Park and, um, and let you know that other folks are listening. So that's really good news. Um, and so um, those have been called already that Prop I um, failed and Prop J passed. Um, so it's it's complicated, and we'll we'll continue to to pay attention to that. Um, I think we have time for um, just one or two other comments about the election. If anyone wants to share, what are you what are you proud of? What do you think of all all the results of the election? I know we also have folks here from outside San Francisco. So if you want to share um, any any good news or other news from outside of San Francisco, please do.
maybe people are ready to take a break from thinking about the election. Well, I'd just like to say that I'm sad that the house is going to flip, which means nothing will get done in the nation like, you know. So these guys just want to uh, not do anything so the Democrats won't get any credit. So that's, that's sad. Thank you, Herman. And we're, we're still waiting for, uh, the results about the the House and and Senate and um and it looks like Georgia is going to a runoff, so there's another election there in December. Um, <clears throat> if folks are interested in doing phone banking, um, I guess I should say for either side because we're nonpartisan, um, but we can certainly give you information uh, about who to who to connect about that. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet who wants to, um, I'm gonna ask people who have not spoken yet, um, who wants to make a comment about the election? Or Lihia, you unmuted, go ahead. Uh, no, I just um, wanted to say that um, for this election, I decided to support another group that has been very active and that's uh, Faye in Action. And um, it was a very, uh, good experience, and I, um, I think that we should work together with other groups also. So, yeah, um, Karen, if you have something very brief to to say, because we are time right now, and we wanted to um, get our next our next um, speakers. Go ahead. I have a brief. I can be brief. Um, I'm just very disappointed. In apparently E has totally crashed and I just hope there will be a post-mortem to find out why that was important. That's all. Thanks, Karen. Um, I, I just want to say, um, yeah, thanks for that, Karen. This is Jessica again. I mean, fortunately, it, I would say it didn't totally crash. It, 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 um, Sorry, it looks like it is going to be defeated, but it's pretty close. Um, and it wouldn't have been close were it not for all of you and so many other people um, fighting for it. And, you know, my quick summary um, and what I'm hearing from other people is just that it is so confusing having, having multiple things that are opposing each other on the ballot. Voters don't know what to think. We're all limited in our time to explain it all to people. And no one knows what affordable housing means anymore. So it's just a big reminder to us that we need to redefine affordable housing and make sure it actually means something to our folks. And so we got some time. Let's uh, let's regroup and make that happen. And last comment from Betty. And then yeah, I just uh, want to and to really encourage people to come to the housing meeting next week because we really need to talk about this because at least I think the average voter was confused about uh, D and E. And so it gives us an opportunity, at least they were thinking about it and thinking about affordable housing. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, really get out there and, and talk with people and, and all. So come to the housing meeting next Wednesday. So thanks all. Thanks, Betty. Okay. Thank you so much for everybody um, making your comments. Um, you know, there's a lot of money that the other side puts away. So, and we need to uh, fight all that money with people. And I think that we didn't have enough people, honestly. I don't think that uh, we did all we could have have done. So it, it's starting with me. So I said it. Um, uh, okay, so now it's time. Um, we have a few guests. I mean, we have three guests from City College of San Francisco, and they will tell us exciting stuff that is happening at City College. And, and so how we um, at SDA can, you know, uh, learn more about what is offered for seniors and people with disabilities in the city. Um, are you guys ready, Ellen? Uh, 
Uh, Alan, Alan said in the chat that he's just finishing a meeting and he hello. Said he would come, oh, oh, here we go. Okay. Great. I can jump in for a I second. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Alan Wong. I'm a member of the City College of San Francisco Board of Trustees. I'm so happy to be here today joining uh, uh, SDA uh, as you guys uh, uh, have your membership meeting and meet all of you. Uh, today, I want to make sure to bring our Vice Chancellor uh, and our Dean to be able to share what kind of services we offer to our community. And so for me, as a, um, as a elected leader, my role at City College too is to really ensure that the community vision is, is shared at City College. And that's why I think it's really important to uh, outreach to your group and ensure that you're getting the information that you need. So uh, I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity for our Vice Chancellor and Dean to really get into details and share what kind of services we offer. So I'll pass it on uh, to, to them. Uh, I, so I believe uh, Vice Chancellor Jesse Lee is here, as, here and so you can introduce the Dean. No, actually, um, this is Kit Dai. I'm the Dean of Older Adults and Chinatown North Beach Center. Uh, my Vice Chancellor, he is in a meeting. So today I will do a short presentation to talk about City College services. So I just wondering, can I share my screen? Yes, give me just okay. one second. Great, thank you. Okay, you should be able to now. Okay, let me see. And then just be sure you describe anything on the slides for folks who are blind or low vision, please. Okay, I will. Let me do a screen sharing. Okay, let's see. Can you guys see it? Okay, yeah. okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Oh, oh, no. thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You have it on the um, like presenter view, so we're seeing your next slide. If you can make it just so we see one, it'll be okay, a little easier. Let's see. Is it okay now? Ah, it's the same, but it's okay. You can go uh, ahead. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Is, uh, am I screening the right? Screen? What? Because I can't see what it shows on the screen. Is it like, is it page one that you guys see? Yeah, we're seeing page one and then page two, we see small on the right, but it's okay. Mm, okay, okay. Let me just do a little bit first. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's see. I'm sorry about this. Let's okay, display setting. Is it okay now? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, once again, my name is Kit Dai. I'm the Dean of Chinatown North Beach Center and um, the Dean of All the Adults. Thanks for the invitation to City College so I can share, you know, what's, um, what we have at City College. Maybe SDA member can benefit from our services and program. So it's a very short um, presentation that uh, we will cover the, the base. Okay. First of all, um, let's me talk about like older adult program. So our older adult program at City College is like is non-credit classes. The beauty of non-credit classes are is open entry, open exit. That means when you have time, you just show up to the class. If you're busy that week, you don't want to go, you don't need to, you know, attend. So and the other thing is like the class is free. So, you know, if you sign up for non-credit classes, you don't have to pay for any tuitions, which is, which is good. And our classes are designed for students who are 55 and older, but all are welcome. So if you're 30 years old, if you want to sign up our older adult, we also welcome you. So, and for what was like so special about our older adult program is our faculty, which really make a big difference. And they are the highlights of our program because they are all skilled and experienced teachers. Many of them, you know, they are in that area for many, many years. And they are the specialists in the area. Like, for example, we have like art instructor. We have instructor who's teaching Tai Chi. They have more than 30 years of experience of doing so. And then they are also a passionate individual. They love teaching and they love communicating with seniors. And they are committed to make your experience a positive one. So with that, I welcome all of you to join our older adults program. And let's look at what we have for this current semester. So at this point, we have five classes and I'm going to you know, um, cover like each of them. So at this point, we are talking about fall schedule, fall semester. So what is fall semester cover? Um, we cover from August 17 to December 20th. If any of the member join our class, you can still have a taste of it. 
And let's see what we have at City College. So basically at this point, we have two main categories is like more in the um, um, wellness type of training, which is like a little more like an active class that you can come to practice Tai Chi or what we call body dyma dynamic. It's like a slow movement that designed for um, seniors. And at the same time, we have um, two classes that fall into the liberal art, which is like focusing on the art because we know that, you know, um, students sometimes they also love art type of classes. So we have two classes. One is art and craft, so you will do work on the little projects. And the other one is focusing on art, which is mainly like painting and drawing. So, and then we can look at the location. So at this point, you know, the five classes we have, they fall into three locations. Uh, we have three classes scheduled at Chinatown North Beach Center, which is over 808 Kearney <laughs> Street. It is like, we are at the corner of Kearney and Washington's. And then we also have one class at our mission center. And then um, knowing that, you know, because of the pandemic, some of our students, you know, they prefer to have remote options. So we also have a um, mind and body health class remotely. So our teacher through Zoom will do exercise with her students. And finally, we also have one special class, which is like sponsored by district number four supervisor's office. We do have an in-person, Tai Chi class over at the South Sunset Senior Centers on every Tuesday from 1 to 2.30. Okay, besides all the adults, what other option, you know, students can consider? So besides, you know, um, all the adults, City College has also have like a wide range of non-credit classes, which fall into, you know, there's one, two, three, five categories. So for basic skills, so we do have English as a second language classes, it level from literacy all the way to high level and also transitional studies. And then the other one, maybe, you know, you can consider is some of our career and technical educations. It might not be of your interest. Maybe some of your friends or family member, they might consider that. Is like we have baking and pastry. We have computer class. We have intro to constructions. We have custodial training and vocational and office technology program. So the third category is like child development and family studies. We have child observation class. This is like for um, students who bring in their, their kids or their grandkids to go to you know, city college to attend a parenting class. Like for example, you know, nowadays, you know, we have all we call like nuclear family. We only have one kids, but they have um, you know, four or six adults raising them. But at home, maybe they don't have like a lot of time to interact with other kids. So the college provide this platform. We have classes called child observations. You can bring in your kids or grandkids into the class. You can, you know, ask our teacher about some parenting, you know, tips, what to do. And most importantly is the kids. They have a chance to mingle with other, you know, kids around their age. So they help them to build social skills. And then the other category, um, we do, so the college have a very robust and um, good DSPS program. And they have a lot of like options for, you know, um, member to consider is like, we have art, we have computer laboratory, we have job search, we have wellness and theater, theater art type of classes. And the last category um, is our lifelong and civic engagement. We also have citizenship classes for um, um, our student. And also the one that I just covered is the older adult classes. So it get to my last, you know, slides. So, you find out, oh yeah, I'm interested, you know, in city college program, how do I register? So this way that, you know, um, folks can register. You can just scan that, you know, QR code. It will um, link you to our non-credit admissions web page that provides you a lot of like options, how to register our non-credit classes. And at the same time, you know, you can email them. They're saying that I'm interested in signing up for city college classes. Can I get more information? The staff there will help you answer your email. Or you say, oh, I prefer to have, you know, some personal touch. I want to talk to someone. You can also give us a call. Staff there will help you. So as I mentioned, you know, we're almost like towards the end of our fall semester. So member might think about, oh, it's, it's a good idea. Maybe, you know, I'm take a break. I'm not going to rush to sign up classes for this semester. Maybe um, I will think about it for next semester in the spring semester. So just a few notes about it. Our spring semester 2023 registration start on Monday, November 28th. 
And then um, our semester start next year, January 17, 2023. And our class schedule should be out hopefully next week or anytime soon. So with that, that's really end my um, presentation. And if you have any questions, just feel free to ask me. And let me stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kit. Is that yes, Kit. Um, this is really good. Um, do you, uh, at City College, is still offer carpentry classes? I'm sorry, uh, what classes? Carpentry. Yep. Um, I don't think so at this point. No. But I can check the you no know, schedule, you know, when it's out next, next week. I can double check that and then I can get back to you. Thank you. Sorry, I I needed to ask that. <laughs> I always wanted to be a carpenter. <laughs> yes. Okay. We, all, we have like different classes, but at this point, you know, our department chair they are, they are still finalizing, you know, the um what we call uh, the spring schedule. So as soon as it's out, I can you know um send it to you, so you will have a copy, and then you can take a look at it. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to make question. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Paula has a question. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I raised my hands. Okay, um, okay. I was just wondering, um, you said that it's in-person and uh, remote also. And so I was wondering, where in the mission is it located? Do you know where is our mission campus on Valencia? Oh, okay. So that's yes. where they have to go then. Yeah, the, uh, we have the art and craft <laughs> class over um, at our mission center. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I also see a question about math classes for senior. We don't have specific classes, math class for senior, but we do have transitional math classes. Maybe this is something of your interest. So if this is the case, as I mentioned, you know, once our spring 2023 schedule is available, I'll email it to um, the contact person as SDA. So in that way they can share with the members. And remember guys, when you start learning something else, you are exercising your brain. So <laughs> we should all take some classes. <laughs> Karen? Yeah, I just wanted to say that when my daughter was little, I took her to um, the child observation class. I, I don't know if it was under uh, community college at that point, but it was held, I believe, in a basement of a church in the Richmond district. And that child is now in her mid fifties. <laughs> so that was a long time ago. The, the draw was the opportunity for the children to get together and play with other children. And the parenting was somewhat of a surprise, but was really the icing on the cake. It was wonderful. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you for the good words. <laughs> um, okay. So with that, we're going to wrap it up and we're going to take a, a short break. Oh, Kathy? Yes. Uh, th yes, thank you very much for your presentation, Kadai. Uh, <laughs> what about the, I'm very concerned that the parcel tax, which was going to uh, infuse City College with a lot of money, had failed. How okay. is that going to affect the, the, the college and the programs? Okay, as much as possible, we will keep the current schedules. And when we, you know, and every year our chair has been asking for more classes. So when we see any opportunity or any additional funding, we will fight to, you know, rebuild our older adult program. So at this point, you see five classes and hopefully next semester, you will see a little bit more. Thank you. And at that point, we all gonna gather and we're gonna go to a rally, right? So that's what SDA, SDA does. So let's do that when that when the time comes. So let's take a, a five minute break. Thank you so much. Thank you. And and thanks for the opportunity for me to share, you know, good news, you know, about City College to the members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take a break, people. How long? Five minutes? Yes, five minutes. So, so don't go. Afar, okay, go get some water, go to the restroom and be ready. We'll be back at 11, 11. And if folks wanna chat with each other here, you can feel free to do that. <clears throat>
Yeah, that's what we love, right? Elisa, you are it's still on the yeah. uh, screen, so maybe we can say something. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Me? Yes, you. <laughs> uh, good. Um, still hanging on with election news. Mm -hmm. And I actually have to leave, but Rhea wanted me to just um, tell people who are interested in the masking equity campaign that we're working on to please oh, join Alyssa, us. Hold on, hold on, because we're doing a five minute break, so we don't want to lose people. Are you able to wait until after the break? And then we can I have, have you to, make your announcement. I have to leave. So that's all I have to say. Oh, OK, then I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, it's a passionate group of people trying to keep all of us, but especially seniors, disabled people, uh, people who are immunocompromised, safe during COVID. And we work passionately and directly with health departments, transit agencies, city governments. And um, we would love it if people would join us. And that's, that's about it. It's a great group of people. Rhea Small is in charge of it. Contact her. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Elisa. And we'll have um, Rhea repeat that for folks later in announcements. And Alyssa, if you want to put anything in the chat, or I'm sure Rhea will, about how people can get involved. That's great. Good to have you. All right. Maya, how are you? Hi, I'm um I'm hard at work on housing stuff. It's it's been a oh, prolonged many, many months challenge. Oh my goodness. So yeah, Peter has been and Jessica to some extent has been really in there with me in it. So I could not not get through this without a lot of SDA and fair housing and um <laughs> yeah, I'm learning to be a disabled senior low-income housing organizer with housing vouchers. So the good news is there's lots of fabulous, excellent organizations and individuals that are helping me, but whew, yeah, it's a journey. Yeah. I'm really tired, um, but I, I am sitting here just, just appreciating everybody here and, um, you know, being grateful to be an organizer and to be in the Bay Area and mm -hmm. you know, feel very. Um, we are very happy to have you here, you know, and I'm I'm glad that you are getting some support. It's, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it is. It's you know, it's been such a rich time to come to the 10th anniversary of SDA and the 50th anniversary of the Center for Independent Living and just be like. I was born in the right time in history, honestly, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I'm just super proud of us. And, um, you know, as I make sort of individual progress, I just really feel it, the collective, collective. Me, you know, that this is not a me situation. This is a we situation and that yeah. where I can make progress is opening pathways for other people and other people. Every time I go on a curb, God, every time I get on paratransit, every time I, you know, use my wheelchair, I just know that I'm, other people fought really hard to give me the opportunity to, to be where I am. So, yeah, I feel kind of teary and exhausted, honestly, but just looking at all these sweet faces, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, I know. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. 
Yes, it's. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know we're about to come back, but um, I see someone on the phone with a hand raised. Yeah. Um, who who is that on the phone? Uh, the person on the phone with the hand raised, who is that? Is that? Hi, Anna Burr, I'm on the phone. Oh, hi, Anna. Hi. Um, I won't be able to go attend the housing meeting next week, but um, I had an idea around affordable housing that I wanted to send out into this world. I don't know if you have my email, Anna, but I can put it in the chat and we can connect. I, I think Anna is on the phone, so. Uh, oh, okay. I can, I can email you. Does that work, Anna? You and Edith can connect, so you can share that and Edith can bring it up at the housing collaborative meeting. I, I won't be able to attend that meeting. Right, no, Edith and you can connect beforehand and then Edith will pass it on. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd like to hear it, Anna. So, so I call your general phone number? I was gonna send you an Say email, now? but if you also wanna, if you wanna call the number, that's also, we can connect either by phone or email. Do you want me to say it now? I don't think we have time. I don't want to interrupt the flow that Jessica and, and the okay, have because so I know we're tight on time. For later. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll call you or, or we can connect over phone or email. Okay. Thanks, Anna. All right. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice little break. Yeah. Um, so um later uh we're gonna have uh Rhea, um talk about what um elisa was sharing and so we um is is it if it's okay with you Rhea? because elisa already started to talk about it can we go to the presentation um from uh Xochitl? is that okay with you Xochitl, also <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. And so we can start. Are you ready? Yeah, can I have permission to share my screen? Also, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We so, will you go ahead and introduce Sochil? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, Sochil is working with the... Um, you see utility, what is it? <laughs> the utility reform network. Yes. <laughs> and she's also my daughter. So I that's why I always forget to introduce her. <laughs> so go ahead, Sochi. Uh, she's gonna talk uh, talk to us about um you know some uh very important stuff on uh PG and &E and the work that Tarn is doing around, you know, equity. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's, I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly. I know we are crunch for time, so bear with me. And if you have questions, please drop them in the chat um, as it's easier for me to, to answer those later in, instead of going while I'm presenting. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, but I'm just going to be talking a bit about affordability today um, when it comes to utilities. And uh, I'll also extend an invite to our um, event that is a community conversation around solutions. So we're not just going to talk about the problem. We're going to talk about the solutions. But yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And yeah, let me know if you have any problems seeing it. And uh, oh no, what's happening? Cool. Can everybody see okay? Perfect. Yep. Awesome. Cool. So um, this is a bit word heavy because I tried to like make it English and Spanish. Those are the languages I know. So bear with me. 
Um, but we're just going to talk about uh, the rising cost of energy and what we can do to create some change. But yeah, I might, uh, there's this little thing that's like, if you were stranded on an island, uh, what three things would you bring? If you guys want to share that in the chat, please feel free. Um, you know, I know we're crunched for time, so I didn't want to do too much. Um, but yeah, just a welcome. Everybody, hi. I've seen everyone here before, most of y'all. And um, it's nice to be here. It's nice to see y'all. So, yeah. So, energy insecurity. Um, energy insecurity is when energy is priced beyond the reach of communities. Um, oftentimes, those communities are going to be people with families, seniors, people with disabilities, veterans, um, low income BIPOC communities. And yeah, a lot of people in California are energy insecure. Um, Turn actually runs a hotline. And I've been hearing a lot of sh shutoffs coming up, people getting notices and really sad. And it's something that is gonna just keep happening as they, you know, lift the moratorium and PG and is like, well, it's time for us to make our money back. So uh sorry, I mess this part up a bit I could not get rid of this transition so sorry but uh what's known about energy insecurity in the U.S. is that it's a hidden hardship it affects 37 million U.S. households um low income is one of the main drivers of energy insecurity uh there is a lot of disparities by race ethnicity and immigration status and as a lot of you know um your zip code determines your light your um i'm sorry your lifespan sorry i couldn't think of the word um and yeah this it it's just geographical racism uh people living in rural communities things like that all of it plays a huge role um households with children and elderly are at the greatest risk of energy insecurity um renters and renters and owners are differently burdened energy inefficiencies contribute to higher costs that could be having uh like a refrigerator that's really old that is not energy efficient um light bulbs that are energy efficient there's a lot of things in our households especially us in San Francisco a lot of us are living in really old homes that haven't been updated in a long time or ever and that contributes to higher costs when you're when you need more energy just to warm up your house for example um, geographical and spatial disparities, like I said, uh, just geographical racism as well. Uh, it involves complex coping strategies, which I'll talk about in another slide. Um, there are adverse consequences to energy insecurity, um, being health, social, economic, and environmental. Health is a predictor and an outcome. Um, yeah, like people in the Central Valley tend to have um, higher rates of asthma and a lot of different health burdens and issues out there because of where they are and because of the climate in those areas and because of how dry it is and you know over here it's really cold and we can have more uh, likelihood of having to need to need heating to just be comfortable especially seniors um, because of what's that the I can't think of the 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 word right now, but just the one where you if you're too cold, it really makes your 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 bones achy. Just I can't remember what it's called right now. I'm so sorry. But I guess I wrote health is a predictor and an outcome twice. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, energy insecurity has created a huge movement towards energy justice, and we know that policy solutions have to be enhanced um, because they're right now, they're just not enough. They're not sufficient. They're not meeting our needs and solving these problems. Um, next slide. So in 2016, they did a study and it showed that um, almost 1 million California households were shut off because energy was priced outside of their reach. Um, obviously that is gonna be way more people because 
one household doesn't mean one person, right? We often live with multiple people and this represents more than 3 million people. This number has grown um, since 2016, but there's been wins, there's been wins. But many of those people were seniors, children, people with disabilities. And yeah, it's, it's really a problem and it's really sad. Oh, see, this is what I'm talking about. Yes, health impacts were can increase the risk of pneumonia, flu, bronchitis, cold, heat stroke, hypothermia, and hyperthermia. Um, not being able to afford heat, the, those are gonna build complex coping strategies. If you can't warm up your house, you might turn on your oven to keep the house warm. That's dangerous. You might bundle up in, in, in sweaters and jackets, but you're still gonna be cold. It's not, it's not safe when we don't have the ability to have energy in our house. Um, it can also lead to sanitation issues, dangerous heating, lighting practices, financial trade-offs. I've known a lot of people who have had to, you know, choose whether or not they're feeding themselves or keeping the lights on. Um, people who can't afford their medicine, who can't afford just their basic needs, can't afford childcare, can't afford, you know, just going to a doctor like they will forgo these things to keep the lights on and yeah that's just a really sad reality of energy insecurity um these are just some numbers that show uh how how many people had disconnection notices um people who are in debt um shutoffs the shutoff rates so this was this is data that is a little bit outdated um these numbers have changed, especially after the pandemic. These numbers have changed in a way. We've won, we've had wins where they're supposed to stop shutoffs, and there's wins where if you have certain pledges like LIHEAP, um, which is a federally funded program that pays a one-time payment up to a thousand dollars annually for someone in need of, you know, getting out of their utility debt or just support. Um, so if you have a pledge with LIHEAP, they cannot shut you off. So we have made some wins and there is a shutoffs reduction act that actually I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, well, this is a story of Ruben Carrillo, sorry, it's actually in the slide after this, but Ruben Carrillo, he um, had adopted about, he adopted six children. They were all in the foster care. He adopted them and um, later on in his life, he had to be on dialysis and um, it was getting to the point where he was having thousand dollar bills um, because of his dialysis, because of his medical need. He was on discount programs and it was still priced out of his reach of him and his family. And because of this, uh, his kids in their adulthood had taken on the role of sharing the burden so they would basically move him around and have you know take care of him one month there one month here another month there and moving someone around who's medically vulnerable can actually have a super negative impact on their health and could even shorten his lifespan so it shouldn't be that he has to move around and be taken care of by all of his kids like he should be able to stay in one place and be able to afford to survive and just be alive like yeah just this country treats poverty as yeah just something that you have to deal with and they don't offer the supports that we need as a society to just take care of ourselves and it's really yeah it's really bad it's really negatively impacting everybody to have this I mean sorry I it, this story makes me really sad every time I think about it but yeah, um, so the Shutoffs Reduction Act, what I was talking about, it makes it so that the utilities have to reduce their reduc their shutoffs by 2024, um, a significant amount. They signed that bill into law in 2017. They had a disconnections proceeding that showed, in 2018, they had a disconnections proceeding which showed how drastic the disconnections and shutoffs were. And in 2020, we got a big win. Um, thank, 
it's both in part of the pandemic, but also from years of advocacy that happened before. Um, the pandemic just it just showed the inequities even more. It highlighted these issues. And so what are some of the things that we want at TURN is that we want a minimum 12-month payment plan. That means that if you are in debt, if you're in arrears, that you can receive a minimum of a 12-month payment plan. doesn't mean that you can only get a 12-month payment plan. You could get more than that um, when you know these things and you're able to advocate for yourself. But a minimum 12-month payment, payment plan is what the utilities are required to give you before it used to be very... Uh, they didn't have any like rules for it. They could be like, well, you get a three month and you get a six month and this person gets a four month plan. Like it was very arbitrary, um, but now they have to offer a minimum of a 12 month payment plan to folks. Um, we also one that they don't have disconnections during extreme weather. There's no deposits, so they cannot force you to pay a deposit to start service if you move somewhere or you're a first time customer with PG&E or any of the utilities, they cannot ask you to pay a deposit. Um, there's no disconnections with the LIHEAP pledge. So if you get a shut off notice and you're applying for LIHEAP, if LIHEAP says we will be supporting you, we'll give you a pledge, they cannot give you a disconnect. They cannot disconnect you during that time while they wait for the LIHEAP pledge. Um, Medically vulnerable customers have additional notifications for shutoff so that they can prepare in advance. There are rate caps for disconnection, so they cannot just be disconnecting people whoever they want. They cannot just constantly do that. There is a cap to how many people they're allowed to disconnect. Obviously, we need them to not disconnect anybody, but it's a start. <clears throat> And like I said, we requiring them to reduce disconnection by 2024 and more, one of which was uh, utility debt relief. We won that uh, about, we won 1.2 billion this year towards that. And that just goes automatically in your bill. And you'll you'll see those coming up as cap, as cap funds, C-A-P-P. So if you've seen that on your PG&E bills, it's just something that we all, that everybody who is in arrears will receive on their bill as a credit. So this was a, a slide to kind of talk about anybody's energy stories. Um, if you're feeling willing to share and get a little vulnerable, um, please share in the chat. And yeah, a lot of people probably have gone through some of these things that I've talked about. And we, we're we building community around that, right? Like this is a problem that we've faced, that we've seen, that we've, even if it's not us personally facing it, we've, we might've seen somebody, our loved ones facing a problem um, with their energy, um, not being accessible, not being affordable, not being quality. Um, so please share if you're, if you're feeling called to do so. Um, but yeah. So I, this is yeah. Jessica. Yes. Um, just with what you were saying a moment ago about um, disconnections, people who lose power and that if you are disabled or older, um, you know, PG&E says to make a plan, but we know that's not really practical for people if you depend on medications that need to be refrigerated or a um, CPAP for sleeping or a power chair that needs to be charged or something. So I wonder if anyone has any any stories particularly about those issues. Yes, um, please share because that is still a problem, right? We we sometimes they have to do. See, this is another issue, right? Because the safety that they haven't done, they haven't like made sure that their systems are safe. They haven't done the upkeep. They haven't done the maintenance, and because of that, they have to do planned shutoffs because it's high risk, right? Because these past few years, I mean, this past like decade, really, they've caused so many wildfires because of their lack of um, just taking care of their own infrastructure that they have to do these planned shutoffs because of the wildfire risk. Obviously, climate change also plays a role, but um, you know, it, it is really like 
you guys are the reasons that we need that. You guys are not taking care of this infrastructure. You guys are the ones in charge of providing service to all of us, right? They have natural monopolies. And if they say we're shutting this off, like if you don't have the means to leave your home, what do you do? And that's a problem. And they don't just provide backup batteries to people. Like you have to advocate for yourself. You have to find a place that will do it, that will provide you with one. Um, or there's there's different programs that people have started. Um, I recently spoke to somebody that has like a community backup generator or backup battery um, that they kind of like uh, pass around. I can't remember their name right now but if i find their email i will send it to you all after this meeting i will find their email and i'll send it after this meeting as well um but those types of things are are not addressing the root issue like it helps but it's not enough right but yes please share your stories on here because this is a real problem that affects millions of people in our state and we should all be caring about this because people deserve dignity people deserve to be able to live safely um regardless of their income regardless of their medical conditions regardless of all these other factors um at the end of the day utilities are motivated by profit um the investor owned utilities are motivated by profit they don't really care about providing quality service they care about making money and even if that means negatively harming our communities so Chil, we have a question by uh, Ulda is asking, is there a still a balance payment plan? I'm not sure um, um, what, um, you know, um, what else is included in that. Uh, Ulda, could you explain a little more? A balance payment, like if you were to leave one place and owing and like owing money and then moving to another? I'm no, not sure. I Go ahead, Elda. A balance payment plan for pg and &E where you pay a certain amount of money each month and whatever money uh, you don't use on your account rolls over to the next month. Yeah, so that sounds like when you have like an uh, analog meter, they they estimate your uh, your usage. When you have an analog meter, they'll estimate your usage and then the following month they will read your meter and then they will make adjustments as necessary. And sometimes you'll overpay, sometimes you'll underpay, and then you'll have to pay the difference or you'll get a credit back. Um, uh, yeah, that's what they tried to fix with the smart meters, but the smart meters have their own set of problems as well. But that sounds like a like what what happens when you have an analog meter is they estimate your bill and then you'll pay your bill and then the next month when they read the meter that's when you'll get the adjustment that's what the question i'm asking the question because with the balance payment plan i have the balance payment plan and i paid the same amount of money winter or summer whichever month it is mm -hmm. and then whatever is extra rolls over onto the next month or you get a credit yeah and I thought that might help someone with their pg e bill or something, but I live in an all electric department. Yeah, I, I'm not sure because I haven't. So it's the same every time or it's like, so you have a predictable pg and &E bill, like you pay the same thing every month? Every single month, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd have to ask my supervisor because I hadn't heard of a balance payment like a uh, plan. Well, I've had it for over 20 years. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, no, that, it might be it might be like a grandfathered plan because I don't know of that any I don't know of that now. Um, but that would be nice, right? If you could predict your bill, but well, it's nice because at the end of the year, you have enough on your bill where you don't have to pay for a couple of months. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that would definitely help out a lot of families. I I don't know of anything like that now, currently. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you for sharing that. I'm going to 
yeah that's an idea that you could definitely be one of those things that we're talking about right like a solution to this energy and security Mm -hmm. problem that we're having so yeah Mm -hmm. uh um so now we have Eddie and uh, Sochin, is your presentation done? Uh, is this is the Q and A? It, it it was not done, but uh, I can go over the last slides kind of quickly. Okay, and uh, Betty, can... would you like to uh, ask your question now? And no, then... I can I can wait till the end okay. till the Q and A at the end. Go ahead, okay. go ahead, Sochin. It's kind of word heavy, so I'm really sorry, y'all, but I'll get through it as quickly as possible because I'm running out of time. Um, but this is a graph that shows the utility costs are outpacing incomes, and it's a little bit confusing, but I want to just focus on the blue and then we'll look at the orange. But in if you look at the blue side, um, the blue is 2011 median income. So people were making less, but the number here, the percentage is that they were meeting all of like this is the sufficiency of their income so they were able to meet 74 percent of their needs with the income that they were making in 2011 and you can see that incomes went up in the blues in the on the orange side but the actual um sufficiency went down so even though the incomes were going up the amount of money that you were spending um to meet your needs like it was meeting less of your needs i'm sorry i'm not i'm trying to rush and i it can tell that it's not as concise as i'd like to be but uh if you see the the drop in the numbers as even though incomes were rising um you're meeting less of your needs with that income like obviously we have inflation there's other there's other things that contribute but when people are making much more money and being able to afford less that's a problem right like we shouldn't be making more and affording less it doesn't make sense um so some of the things that are baked into our rates is uh we we are paying for wildfire mitigation plans we uh pay for electric vehicle charging stations yep those are baked into our rates rate payers have to pay for these things um and we also subsidize solar uh incentives so even if you're a poor person that may never ever ever have an electric vehicle or may never have a solar panel in your home you're paying to subsidize these things you're paying to you know elect you're paying to like electrify the grid you're paying for other people to be able to use these perks um and that's a problem because it's a regressive tax as people get off the grid as people move to solar it shouldn't be on the on the backs of rate payers um to pay for those things and why are energy costs skyrocketing i kind of talked about it a little bit but so the California state legislator, I'm going to talk about the, the California state legislator, the CPUC, and another thing, but they pass laws on, the legislator passes laws on energy policy. They appoint and confirm CPUC commissioners, and they direct the $300 billion budget. They direct the regulatory authority and actions of the CPUC, and they unfortunately ignore energy and climate needs of California's low income communities. They aren't, they consistently propose energy laws that overburden ratepayers. They abdicate their responsibility to ensure energy is treated as a basic need and policy decisions are often influenced by high paid industry lobbyists. So they're not really working for the people. They really not. Um, And then, so the CPUC or the California Public Utilities Commissions, they're the ones who have to regulate um, the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, gas, communications, water, and rail companies. So they're they're chartered to ensure safe, reliable utility service, reasonable rates, and protect consumers against fraud. They're responsible for setting rates and regulations for the utilities. They're overseen by governor appointed commissioners and they serve a six year term. So we don't choose who they are. They're chosen by the governor, but Mm. they maintain cozy relationships with IOUs and often have revolving doors for employment opportunities. There are commissioners who literally used to work at IOUs. Like it's not, it doesn't make sense. It's clearly like a conflict of interest, but 
Yeah, they have limited oversight of utilities. They lack the power to actually create institutional change. They often bend to the will of the companies that they're supposed to be regulating. And they have these long processes um, that limit community engagement. So they're not, they're not very transparent in their practices. And then the investor owned utilities are private enterprises acting as public utilities. So they're owned by shareholders with the prof with the purpose to make profit. They're authorized through the CPUC to operate as a monopoly, which doesn't make sense. If we're supposed to say that monopolies are illegal in this country, but as long as they're regulated, then they're okay. That makes no sense. Um, they're authorized to collect operating rev costs and revenue through rates. So we pay for everything. We pay for everything. And then they still make profit and they still go to shareholders because they have a guaranteed rate of return. Anyways, uh, profit motive provides incentive for poor safety and service. Like I was saying, they don't keep up with maintenance of their own infrastructure. They have repeated negligence. Their repeated negligence is ignited fires that have cost lives and property and buy to the, the town of Paradise in California. And they consistently apply and receive ratepayer money with limited or no accountability. Yeah, your rates have gone up 22% this year alone. <laughs> Just letting y'all know. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have time for a breakout session, but yeah, moving towards energy justice, right? Those are the those are the bad things. Those are what's wrong with it, right? But energy justice, it talks about the goal of achieving equity and this both the social and economic participation in the energy system, and it also remediates the social, economic, and health burdens of those disproportionately harmed by the energy system. Um energy justice explicitly centers the concerns of communities at the front lines of pollution and climate change um, working class people indigenous communities and those that have historically been disenfranchised by racial and social inequity and energy justice aims to make energy accessible affordable clean and democratically managed for all communities and that came from our buddies over at the initiative for energy justice um but yeah so how we win right we got to build a base. We're going to have more community conversations, house meetings, one-to-ones, um, education and outreach, workshops, trainings, listening sessions, surveys. People don't know these things. And the more they know, the more they're able to advocate for themselves and fight for change. And then targeted actions showing up. The legislators, CPUC commissioners, and utility company executives, we need to make them be more fearful of us, OK? We have power. We have power. We don't have to just take this. Um, so building power to create change. We build power across California to tackle issues related to climate change, energy and communications justice, expanding leadership and political engagement among people most impacted and historically excluded from decision-making processes. And we win racial and social justice that ensures that every single person in California has access to clean, affordable energy and communication services. So these are ways that you can get engaged. You know, I'm gonna share the afford energy affordability survey in the chat. Um, but yeah, speak up, use your voice. There's gonna be, you know, participation hearings. They have them every once in a while. When they happen, you know, get on a call, let them know how you feel, like shame them. We need to bring back shame. We need to shame the commissioners. Sorry, that's not a turn policy. That's just me saying that. <laughs> I just got to put that out there, but we need to bring back shame. Make them feel bad for not doing a good job. Okay, like you guys need to work for us, not vice versa. The P stands for public, not for PG&E, okay? Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, but yeah, movements need all kinds of people, okay? Like everybody's voice matters. We wanna hear all of y'all, but um, yeah. That's my email, I'm Sochil. I'm in Northern California as most of y'all are. So if you have any other things to reach out to me for, please do so. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, okay? Thank you for listening. I'm sorry that it was so long. All right. Betty, you have a you had a question, right? <laughs> well, I did, but after this second part of the presentation, I'm so uh, wanting to SDA to get involved uh, and do as much <laughs> as we can uh, to work to work with turn. 
Uh, maybe it's something, um, <laughs> another thing to add to the housing collaborative, but also includes HAP. I mean, it's just, it includes so many of what we do. So we really need to, and I thought you did a wonderful presentation, uh, really very good. The, my little question was, if people um, do not pay their, are not able to pay their bill, so the next month they get the bill for the prior month and the new month, do they also have to pay uh, extra fees and interest? Is, is that added on in addition to just, you know, trying to pay what they weren't able to pay the prior month? Do you know um, that? I don't believe that there's any added interest. However, you do have that remaining balance. Yeah. Um, so there's a few options when you have those. And it really sucks that it's not better. I wish I could say that there's better choices, but really the main options for people that are in debt is to apply for LIHE. But that's also, you know, if you're not a citizen, if you're not a citizen, Ooh. it's hard, right? Like if, yeah. if you don't have that privilege, it's not going to be for you because that's a federally funded program. Mm. And apply yeah. for LIHEAP to help with some of the arrears. Um, another thing you could do is literally go to a local place that helps with utility assistance. And I wish that there was a better answer. I really do. That's why we need to fight for something that is a pool for people that need help with their utilities because it needs to be treated like a basic human right. And it's yeah. not, uh, right now it's not. Even though if your house doesn't have lights on, it's considered uninhabitable, that's still not treated as a basic right. And that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, but there is an arrearage management plan. Like let's say you fell off because you know you lost your job but now you have income again, you can get a payment plan that you, while you're making your payments towards what you, what you have coming up, it starts to take away the debt that you have previously. So you're not paying double, but what you're paying is also counting towards the debt that you've accumulated. Yeah. But, and, but the thing is, if you can't afford to pay a payment plan, you can't afford your regular bill it might not be the best thing, right? Because you can miss payments, you can miss one, you can miss two even, but they can't be consecutive. If you miss twice in a row, then you're off that payment plan. But mm -hmm. the debt that you paid off does stay off. So it's it has its flaws, but it is something. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Zuchi. thank you, Betty. Um, so Jessica and then Sarah? Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, thank you so much, Sochil, for speaking on this and for all your work at TURN. Um, I am on the medical baseline program because I depend on a CPAP related thing and um, my wheelchair has to charge at night. And I can I get just a show of hands of how many other people are on the medical baseline program or should be who uses some kind of medical equipment that needs power? Yeah. And I okay, want you to know that oh, go med ahead. medical baseline is actually one of the most under uh, under enrolled programs at PG&E. So in order to apply to medical baseline, you do have to be enrolled in CARE or FARA, which is their low income, like uh, their, their discount programs. So you have to be in a part of CARE or FARA, I believe, but- No, medical you don't. Wait, Sorry. What? You, you don't, don't have to. Quality. You don't have to qualify as low income. Oh no, not for medical baseline. Oh wait, yeah, you're right. You're so right. You're so right. You're so well, right. So I wanted to say other people have a medical I'm baseline thinking, program. I'm thinking about the AMP program. Sorry, y'all. I'm no. I'm, it's very confusing. It's very confusing. Um. So I just got a letter saying that they are starting to charge um people on the medical baseline program for this. PCIA power charge indifference adjustment. Yeah. And it's a weird letter that, that says the PUC, which Sochil was just talking about, authorizes them um, to, to start charging people, which they were currently, which they were previously exempt from. So um, maybe offline, Sochil, I'd love to hear if you in turn know more about this. And this may be something that, that we need to fight because it seems ridiculous. 
Yeah, so they recently did that. They recently said that people who were previously exempt for the PCIA charge um, now have to pay for it. And they we do we do know about that. So we can definitely connect on that later, Jessica. But you're right. And I just want to say, yes, you do not have to qualify for care for medical baseline. But for the AMP program, which is the arrearage management program, you do have to be on care or FARA to qualify for that. Sorry. And then, no, thank you for that. And then I just wanted to say, I know there's a lot to say on this topic, and I think we're all wishing we had another half an hour. We'll hear from Betty and Sarah, um, and then we have to move to announcements. But um, can I get a show of hands again? You can just physically raise your hand if that's accessible to you, of who's interested in finding a time for a follow-up conversation about this or information on how to apply for these programs? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought there were some okay. folks. Okay, so we will make that happen. You will hear from, from SDA staff about that at some point. Okay. And I'll turn it over to Betty next. I think it's Sarah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lehia. Oh, no, I just wanted to, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to read off the uh, chat because uh, there is some good information here. I'm not going to do all of it. But first of all, we have so Sochi's um, email address, which is xmontano. M O N T A N O at turn.org. So that's how you can contact um, Sochil. And then uh, Edith put in some information about the LHEAP, which is Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. There's a long website there listed. Um, I don't know how to read that out exactly. But um, just so you know, there is a Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. And then also there the medical baseline program that uh, Jessica was talking about. You can find that um, on the PG&E website. Um, and um, that's the, once again, the medical baseline program. That's all. Thank you, Sarah. So I, I saw another hand and then they disappeared. Uh, I think it was Pat. Were you? Yeah, it was Pat. Pat, I, I, you're on mute. Yes. Hello. On mute. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I have a question. I didn't know that CPAP machines, which I use, use that much energy that you would need to be on a special program. Yeah, you qualify for medical baseline. So. There are, there are actually a lot of medical conditions and equipment that gets you a credit through medical baseline. And if you live with multiple people in your home that rely on things, you get a credit for each person that uses a medical equipment or that has a medical condition that's qualified. And also, sometimes if you're even if you're not qualified for something, if you're a medical care provider um, says that you have a need, have a need for um, uh, more energy use that, you know, you need your heating on to be comfortable, whatever the case may be, um, then sometimes they'll allow you to have medical baseline. They're supposed to say that you're able to, because why do they have the authority to be like, no, you don't qualify if your medical provider is saying it. Mm -hmm. But I heard not long ago that somebody said that they did not, um, that they did not get their medical baseline, even though their doctor had uh, qualified them. So please, if any, if you know anyone like that who has tried and got denied for medical baseline, please let me know. Um, yeah, because PG&E should not have the authority to go against your doctor's mm -hmm. sale. I think so. Okay, I have Thank one. Thank you, Pat. Uh, um, we're gonna wrap, wrap this up because we need to go to the next part. Is it a quick thing? Yeah, just a quick question. How could an energy company be other than a monopoly? Um, there, yeah. So unfortunately, the way that it works is that they are allowed to be a monopoly because they have regulators. Um, but those regulators often work in their favor. So it doesn't even make sense. They're just operating as a monopoly period with very little oversight. Um, so yeah, the there's that, that loophole, right? That if they're regulated, then they can operate as a monopoly. But 
the regulators aren't doing their job in protecting the consumer. Okay, thank you. But there are there are publicly owned utilities. Um, I know in Sacramento they have um, publicly owned utilities. They have. Oh yeah, see, Edith said in the chat that the CCAs are a start toward that path. So CCAs are community choice aggregates, and they give choice to consumers to be like, well, we don't want to be part of PG&E, so we're going to pay the CCA instead, but the CCA still uses PG&E's infrastructure or and the, uh, the IOU's infrastructure because that's the one mm -hmm. in place, yeah. but that comes with its own different types of charges, but um, it is it is choice, right, but it's it it has its own faults as well, but I I still think that you know it 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 allows us to be like well we don't want PG and E we want to get service here but PG and E still does the customer service for CCAs, so it, and we have CCA here in San Francisco, right? Yeah, we their CCAs their CCAs like around like a lot of them actually. I'm part of a CCA, but in Oakland, so yeah. okay. Thank you, Sochin. I'm going to drop our energy affordability survey in the chat and I'm going to have, we're having an event on November 30th where we discuss solutions and different um, things that we might want to bring to the legislator next year for the legislative cycle. So if you want to be part of that conversation and give your ideas, please register. We'll see you on the 30th of November. Um, but yeah, please take the energy affordability survey. It does give us some insight into what's going on with folks in the community. And we just love to hear from you all. Mm -hmm. I'm dropping thank you in the chat. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. And um, now we have our um, um, our staff, um, Rhea. Thank you so much, Lahia, and thank you so much, Socho, for that wonderful presentation. And I can tell people are really excited about this. So I hope we can keep working on energy issues at SDA. Um, so I just wanted to continue um, the announcement that Alyssa started during the break. Um, oops, my video just disappeared. Um, I don't know if people can still see me. Um, Cool, thank you. And I wonder, Beth, would you like to join me for this one? I, I know you just joined the meeting late, so no pressure at all if you're not ready, but if you want to um, fill in maybe after um, anything, if you wanna add. Okay, I'll keep it short. So I'm just um, announcing um, in our Masks for Equity group, we've been working to keep the mask requirement in healthcare settings, which, um, Hopefully most people know it's still in place, like when you go to the doctor or the hospital or physical therapy, any kind of patient setting, everyone's still required to wear masks to protect against COVID, both um, employees and patients. Um, and we've been working to keep that in place. We're meeting with California Department of Public Health soon. Um, and we're part of a coalition with other groups, including California Nurses Association, the Center for Independent Living, Nobody is Disposable, Marked by COVID, Flair, and others. Um, so that's, um, I just wanna invite people who are excited about this and who wanna keep the mask requirement in healthcare and keep um, other COVID safety measures in place to join our group. We'll be meeting next Thursday, the 17th from two to 3.30. And another quick announcement is about remote participation. Um, I don't know if people heard, but in San Francisco, Supervisor Mandelman introduced legislation to get rid of remote participation for government meetings. That means like anything happening at City Hall, we can't join via Zoom, we can't call in, we can't make comment if we can't get there, um, which, you know, is a huge problem, especially as the pandemic continues for immunocompromised people, for seniors, for other disabled people, for anyone with kids at home, for anyone working a full-time job, like just, yeah, so many people can't physically get to City Hall, but are still have a huge stake in the issues that are being discussed. And so, yeah, so we're working with a coalition as well to keep remote participation. Um, and there'll be a vote on it on December 5th. Jessica, do you wanna add about that? I just wanted to encourage people to contact your supervisor and say, vote no on getting rid of remote participation. Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to add on a couple of things on that. So the 
Um, there's going to be a hearing on Monday, December 5th at 10 a.m. And we're definitely going to want lots of people to call in. We're going to have a Zoom room so we can watch together and share talking points. Um, so if you're interested in that, please go ahead and put your name in the chat so we can be sure to be in touch with each other. But we'll send that information out to everyone as well. Um, and then we also have a letter that we're asking organizations to sign on to. Um, and I just put the link in the chat and we'll send that out by email too. Um, so if you're part of another organization that can sign on to this, um, please, um, I think it's comment only. So I think you can, you can put it at the end and then we'll accept it. Um, and then Sarah asked, what is the justification? Um, Ray wrote that it takes too long and out of county people can call in. And so partly uh, we need to, to get across that um, the taking too long is not a real argument, that it's important to hear from community members and that we actually are from the community, that we are not outsiders, that we should be heard. <laughs> and Sarah adds, um, hi, democracy. Um, we'll share more in the chat later. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Um, yeah, thank you all. Um, and I'll put my info in the chat and also, yeah, put your name if you want to come to the remote participation hearing. Um, great, thank you. Thanks, Rhea. I'm going to go to um, Beth next because I imagine it's related. Thanks, Jessica. Um, yeah, I just wanted to hit a few more points on uh, what Rhea was talking about in healthcare um, as far as mask requirements. Most other um, uh, states at this point have removed mask requirements in healthcare settings. And um, this not only affects like hospitals and doctor's office, dentist's office, it's your in-home healthcare provider. Um, I'm hearing stories of people in other states having um, their in-home healthcare providers show up without mask and them not being able to refuse services or having to decide between refusing services and not getting medical services that day. Um, and folks in nursing homes, I just don't understand how we can think about removing masks there. So um, yeah, and um, if you join, you get to see what an amazing job Rhea is doing and organizing us all. And um, we're making some headways and I really um, value and treasure this group and I invite you all to participate. Thanks. Thank you, Beth and Rhea. Um, before we, um, well, I guess I would just wanna say briefly the next announcement um, is that if anyone has to go, I'm sorry that we're running a little behind, but we'll be done very soon. Um, our next meeting in December, our next general meeting is gonna be a hybrid meeting. Um, in December, we usually do a holiday party. We're gonna have right. Connie Julin, our volunteer um, amazing pianist come and play. We'll have some singing um, and we'll do some dreaming for the new year and what we all wanna see. So if you can come in person to the church, um, you are welcome to do that. If you want to join us online, that will definitely be an option, um, but mark your calendars for December 8th at 10. Um, and next, I'm going to go to Edith for the next announcement. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but there's going to be a housing action next Tuesday. So it's with REP, who is the Race and Equity and All Planning Coalition that we're a part of. And it's going to be a big rally of a bunch of different organizations, November 15th at 1 p.m. in front of City Hall. Um, there's this thing called the housing element, which I don't have a whole lot of time to jump into, but basically it's the city's 10-year plan of what kind of housing will be built. Um, and so far, the latest draft does not prioritize deeply affordable housing, let alone accessible housing, um, and really puts a lot of power in the hands of developers. Sorry, let me slow down a little bit. And really puts a lot of power in the hands of developers. Um, so we're gonna be showing up as an SDA contingent. Kathy Lipscomb will be speaking, um, and there will be other speakers and organizations present at 1 p.m. And then at 3 p.m., we'll have the option to either stand outside and call in, um, or you can go inside and also make public comment that way. Um, but we're demanding that the Board of Supervisors um, takes into account the citywide people's plan, which prioritizes community expertise within the city's 10-year housing plan, rather than just listening to the, obviously the, the developers that are really putting their finger on the scale here. Um, but I'll put that in the chat. If you're interested in joining us, there's a bit.ly link to RSVP. I also really would appreciate if you call or email me just to let me know, because I'm trying to figure out to make sure that we can all show up together and I'm bringing snacks and that sort of thing. 
Oh, and it's also going to be live streamed. Thanks, Edith. I hope to see many of you there on Tuesday. Um, if members have announcements, by the way, please either put it in the chat or go ahead and raise your Zoom hand. And next we have Peter. Hi, folks. Uh, Peter, uh, speaking on the, uh, the, uh, the Wi-Fi campaign today. First off, uh, big shout out and thanks to everyone who came to the teach-in. Uh, special appreciation to Cora McCoy, our facilitator extraordinaire, our MC. Um, it was a great event and we're looking ahead to the next one. Um, we've been working closely with Supervisor Preston's office, as some of you know from working on the campaign or some of you know from the teaching, uh, on a resolution that is going to go to the Board of Supervisors for them to essentially um, signal their support for our demands. The, the resolution is essentially putting our demands in a non-binding form, but the supervisors expressing their support for what we have called on AT&T and other large internet service providing corporations to do. Um, to end digital redlining, to expand access to low cost programs, to remove hurdles for people to enroll, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into the whole list right now. Um, but we're really excited because we're, we're tentatively looking at a press conference in early December, um, right before the Tuesday Board of Supervisors hearing on December 6th. Uh, that's likely when the vote will be to actually um, get this thing passed. And uh, we'd really love to see all of you there, uh, to be there with everyone. I think it's going to be a really good press conference. We've got some good speakers, uh, and it's the next step in moving this moving this campaign forward. We will also live stream it, I'm sure. We've, we've done that uh, for, for everything in the past, and so we'll, we'll make sure that that happens. Um, but tentatively, December 6th, Tuesday, around 12.30, uh, is this press conference. We will, of course, be sending you info once it's all confirmed, once all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, but that's what we're looking at. Uh, really hope to be there with a lot of you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Next, we have Lihia to talk about the wheelchair repair clinic, and then we'll have um, Maya. Um, hi, everybody, again. <laughs> so uh, December 16, we're going to have our wheelchair repair clinic at Clementina. Uh, and so um, we want a little grant and we're going to have a little bit of um, going beyond just a little repair. So if you know anybody that needs that, please let them know. Uh, you're going to receive some information about it. And so expect that and block it if you wanted to participate, let me know. Um, I'm gonna put my information on the chat. Thank you very much. It's December 16. Thanks, Lihia. Maya? Oops. Um, hi, um, so many exciting things. Um, yes, I will have more information soon, but I just wanted to um, let folks know that the, Disability Justice Culture Club has had a like event organizing group um, and we're going to have our first public gathering that we already had a conversation with Jessica and SDA East Bay about. Um, we're confirming the location um, and it is going to be on Sunday, December 18th. Uh, and it's going to be a solstice gathering that will include community food, uh, body work and acupuncture, music, dance, ritual, ancestor, altar. Um, we're really excited that, to, to gather a number of different groups and artists, but really centering around the, um, the heart of what Stacey Park Milburn, uh, who is the, you know, ancestor founder of um, Disability Justice Culture Club called like Revolution and Chill of really bringing arts and culture into community building in a disability justice space. So we'll let you know more about it and we'll definitely be collaborating with SDA, um, but it's we're, we're gonna be meeting actually with the Center for Independent Living next week to see if we can do it at Ed Roberts, um, but we'll let you know soon. <clears throat> and so much gratitude to everybody here. Thank you so much, Maya. Do we have any other announcements? All right, well, thanks everybody for sticking around a few extra minutes. 
Um, thank you to our speakers and everyone for participating. Uh, thank you to our interpreters and our captioner, of course. We will um, send an email um, probably tomorrow with all the information that came out of this meeting. Um, and we hope to see you all soon. There's a lot going on in the next few weeks. So make sure you're plugged in or email or call um, any of us. Um, anything else from anyone? We hear you want to do the closing? Uh, well, you kind of did, right? I mean, it was just <laughs> thanking everybody for being here and welcome to the uh, new people that, uh, you know, um, got here to our meeting and and hopefully you'll stay connected. It's good to see you all. So, um, and hopefully, you know, we're gonna uh, see each other on those actions. And um, I wanted to make sure that you guys know that there's a lot of uh, threats to Medicare, traditional Medicare. And so please, you know, um, be aware of that. And um, I will be sending information about it so you can make phone calls. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And have a wonderful weekend. Long weekend, that is. Can I say something? Yes, it was please. nice to see you. This is Guadalupe. Nice to see you all, guys. I've been having a hard time here at home. Lots of issues going on the last month. But it's great to see you all. And uh, if I don't see you again, happy holidays. But I hope to see you before that. Thank you. Great yeah, to see you too, Lupita. Lupita. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.